Hello and, and good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Stutman. I'm president of the Boston Teachers Union. I was going to say in Governor Dukakis' uh, presence that I did bump into him in Costco. He didn't tell you what he said to me. He said something like, boy, are they kicking the crap out of you. <laughs> I was going to say, Governor, they still are. Um, I'm glad to be here, and as president of the 7,500-member uh, 7, union, I'm used to catching media flack, especially in this climate. Uh, but there are always a few sides to every story, so let me tell you a little bit of the public edu education story that you probably don't read about or hear about every day. By the way, I'm going to talk more about the schools and less about the economics. I didn't know that um, we'd be talking as much about economics. I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, obviously as we uh, move forward. My daughter is, a, just to give you a little background about myself and the negotiating team and how the, the schools uh, pretty much operate. My daughter is a student in the Boston Public Schools. She's attended four schools at five sites, both pilot schools, traditional schools, and exam schools. Uh, and I know what it is to be a parent. My daughter has received a, a good education, not a perfect education, but a good education. And next year she'll be off to college, which is a dream all Boston teachers have for all of their students, a journey to college and a worthwhile uh, education. We represent 7,000 members, a majority of whom live in the city. We have a negotiating team and staff of 13 people who have had 21 children and grandchildren who have been students in the Boston Public Schools. That is quite an accomplishment, I can tell you. For years we have negotiated with people, none of whom have had a single child in the Boston Public Schools. And as the captain of a negotiating team with 21 children in the Boston Public Schools, we are proud of that. And I say that um, it hasn't been an obligation for us whatsoever to put our own children in the public schools. We are very pleased with the choice and the choices within the Boston Public Schools. And I'm trying to find the right glasses, which I didn't bring. So you'll have to uh, put up with that. Um, unlike some of the people who observe our schools from afar, and we use private schools and spend $40,000 a year in tuition, we do believe in public education, and we do put our own children, without feeling it's an obligation, in the schools. Now, you'll hear a lot about our schools. It goes something like this. The schools are mediocre at best. The teachers in their unions are selfish and do little good except drain the public coffers. You hear that all the time. You hear it in the Globe, you see it on Channel 5, you read it in the Phoenix. But here's the other side that I'd like to share with you. Public school teachers do a reasonably good job. Now, I use the word reasonably. No one's perfect. We want to be better, but no one's perfect. Our schools are not perfect. But we in, our, in, in the unions recognize their obligation to the public good and the public welfare. We expect to be held accountable. We recognize our obligation to do the best we can and to make some changes, but the changes that we are asked to, be, to make have to be sensible changes. I'll get to a sensible change in a minute. Making change just for the sake of making change because everyone knows everything there is about schools because they were a student once. <laughs> doesn't make sense to us unless it's a sensible change. Making change for the sake of change may not change our schools at all. And while we recognize the fiscal situation and we're not blind to reality, we see the need for fiscal reform and tax reform, but our definition of reform is far more than cost-shifting savings from the city onto the backs of the employees of uh, Boston. We believe that real tax reform both on both the state and, and uh, city level, which would bring in more revenue by seeking new and fairer sources, is essential to the continued financial health of the city. Now, a little background on the Boston Public Schools, something you probably don't know unless you've been in a Boston Public School. Our schools are reasonably good. That's not what you tend to hear. It's not what some people want you to hear. The schools are not violent places. They're fairly orderly. Walk into any school in any classroom. The chances are good you will see actively engaged teaching and learning. You'll also find that our schools show their wear and tear. The facilities are generally below standard. 
They lack appropriate sanitary facilities, and they lack educational resources such as science labs and functional computer labs. Despite all this, you'll find cheerful children and you'll find engaged staff who make the best of a less inadequate situation. A situation, by the way, that would be unheard of in suburban Boston. By the way, if they haven't torn down the old Newton North High School, we'll take it. <laughs> I've been in that school. It is better than the majority of the schools in Boston, even though it leaks. So how do our schools measure up academically? There's really only one national test in this entire country, although with the Common Core standards coming, there'll soon be another one. The NAEP, which is a National Assessment of Educational Progress test, is the only such national test given in this country. There are 18 urban areas in the country that volunt voluntarily participate in something called an urban showdown. They all get together and their marks are all scored. And how does Boston do? Well, it may surprise you, it doesn't surprise me. Boston last year came in fourth highest in eighth grade math. And by the way, eighth grade math is a proxy for fifth grade math. When I say math, it's, it's how we do in math. It, it isn't just the eighth graders are doing well and no one else is. We came in fifth in the country in eighth grade, in eighth grade math last year. We've been pretty much either fourth or fifth in the country in math ever since the test has been given and other urban areas have participated. That's for the last six or seven years. In English, we came in fifth. Now the cities we beat out, they're not all terrible cities. Philadelphia, Houston, Atlanta, Chicago, New York City, nine other cities voluntarily participate and we, we beat all those cities. Now you may have heard actually that the entire state does well on the NAEP, which by the way is the most well-regarded uh, test in the country. I heard the governor take credit for this the other day. He said Massachusetts schools led the nation. I think he even has a TV ad about that. Um, it's a great ad. He's very proud of the schools and he's relying on data at five years old, four years old, three years old, two years old, and last year. All before ed reform legislation. I'm so glad we taught the nation before we had ed reform. Because some people think it's taken ed reform to get us moving. I can tell you with certainty, mass schools were the best in the country before ed reform. Boston also won the Broad Prize a few years ago as the best urban district in America. I could go on, some would believe me, but some of the, I know naysayers, not necessarily in this audience, would not. And they would say he's just posturing. But I can tell you that our schools for an urban area in America do very well. Now, we don't do as well as the suburbs, uh, to be sure, but we do well whether we get credit for it or not. Now, I want to be careful here and pass my words. I don't want anyone leaving here thinking that I'm saying we should be complacent about being fourth or fifth best in the country in an urban area. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I'm not saying we should take a backseat to the suburbs, but I do want to give a fair comparison of how well our schools do apples to apples. And we're not saying, by the way, either, that there should be an urban ceiling, that urban schools should only be so good and the suburbs will always do better. That's not necessarily true. But what is true is that the bottom line is we do a better than average job and our schools have done very well consistently of educating uh, our children. Now, so we do a good job, we'd like to do a better one, and we're under increased scrutiny every day for test scores that are you know, mediocre, even though they may be better than the Lawrences and the Lowells and the Springfields of the world. But they're never high enough. We realize that our public school system is a, is a franchise that is the, at the crossroads of sorts. And at the same time, as, pu as a public employee union, um, we have a duty, a legal duty, to represent our members as fairly as we can, just as the firefighters union has a duty to represent its members. Now, we, don't, we view the goals of having good schools and being fair to our members as not being mutually exclusive. You can have both. And just to carry this a step further, we believe that schools will improve if employees are treated fairly. That's the carrot. Now the stick. We don't believe that punishing our employees, as has been done on the race to the top and under um, the Ed Reform legislation, will improve our schools. Now, 
I understand for many in the audience and many who read the papers and just basically understand the conditions from what they hear, it may be a big assumption and a big leap for me to ask you to believe that the union wants better schools. We do, but you hear the opposite every day. You probably hear that we represent workers in their best interest and that's all we care about. Now some of the benefits we have, as Michael uh, explained, the health insurance is a rich benefit. We understand in these, economics t in these economic times, some of the benefits like health insurance are easy to poke at and are easy to, to call out. We understand and we appreciate the fact that we have good health coverage and we feel everyone should have good health coverage. We get it. We understand that taxes pay the freight for the benefits that we get. We get that too. And I want you to know that we have worked with the city to ameliorate the health care issue. In fact, we haven't gone so far as to join the GIC. Michael is correct. If we were to join the GIC, it would cost every teacher, every policeman, every parks department worker in Boston anywhere from $600 a year to $3,000 a year, depending on usage and out-of-pocket increased expenses. We haven't gone that far, but we are ahead of the city on Medicare. And by that, here's what I mean. Medicare would transfer costs to the federal government. We are ahead of the city in negotiating. In fact, we had the idea before they did that our active members ought to be able to join Medicare and ought to be forced, frankly, to join Medicare when they become Medicare eligible. The city wasn't um, up front on that as we were. And that is a tremendous cost saving to the city. And I say that because I want you to know that we are cognizant of the fact that our, our benefits are rich. But we represent our employees ultimately and we have to do and we want to do what is best for our employees. And I, I plead guilty to that as every uh, union president anywhere pleads guilty to that, I hope. But I do so respectfully. And if that were all we did, just to do what's best for our members, our public posture would deserve some of the beatings that we get. If all we cared about were lessening our work and increasing our pay, we'd deserve your anger. If we paid no attention to the educational product in the classroom, you'd have a right to question our sincerity. And you'd be correct to label us as selfish. But you have to realize that that's not true. We spend a lot of time at the bargaining table uh, trying to improve our schools. You may not hear about that, but that's what we do. Now, what you hear about is that we oppose merit pay in charter schools. That's, I'd say, those are the two most serious issues that you hear about. If you oppose charter schools, you are obstructionist. And if you don't like merit pay, I guess you're not a capitalist, I don't know. <laughs> but for whatever the reason, you stand in the way of progress if you oppose those two concepts which some genius or a series of geniuses have figured out will do better things for our schools. Let me talk a little bit about charter schools because charter schools uh, are on the upswing and it's very difficult to get a good word out there as far as what charter schools do and I think everyone should know. First of all, charter schools cream off students. Now, I know they operate by lottery. Anyone can get into a charter school. But charter schools are not obligated to teach special ed or ELL students. They're not obligated. If you go into the Mass DOE website and take a look at the demographics for any charter school in Boston, that's what I'm familiar with, you will find that very few of them do SPED students. They just, the SPED students are eligible to go there. But when they get to the school, there are no SPED programs. They certainly don't do high incidence programs, for example, of children with autism. And no charter school, except for the Excel Academy in East Boston, has any ELL students, which make up roughly 45% of the students in the Boston public schools. So while there is a lottery and anyone can enter a charter school, there is not a program for all children. So what happens is at the end of the road, as a student matriculates, if you look at the demographics of a charter school, you will see that the children are all in regular ed. There are no special ed students. Now I know there's an exception here or there. There are some decent charter schools and they ought to be commended for doing what the rest of us do every day. And what the rest of us do every day is we educate all students. We're proud of the fact that we educate all students. 
We welcome all students. We don't kick anyone out and say there is no program. One last point on charters and why we oppose the funding formula. The funding formula is as complex as a packet that probably takes up the size of the uh, white pages in Boston. It's a thick law, and it's a thick formula. And, it, and it basically what it does every year, at the end of the day, it takes money out of the city of Boston uh, for charter school students. So Boston has, let's say, 20 charter schools, 5,000 charter school students, and the city gives $60 million to the charter schools through the state to educate these students. Okay, $60 million. That number, because of the Ed Reform Law, the $60 million will double over the next four years. That's $120 million that comes out of the school department budget to educate students in charter schools. Now, there's been a school of thought for years. Hey, listen, the kids are in the Boston Public Schools. They leave the Boston Public Schools, and the money goes with them. What's your problem? I mean, that's the underlying thought. The kids leave, the money leaves. There, it, it costs less to educate the kids who are left. Uh, what's the big deal? Well, the truth is that probably a majority of the kids who go to charter schools have never been in the public schools. They go directly from parochial schools. They go directly from private schools. So the charters won't give us that information. You know why they won't give us that information. Uh, but it came out the other day in the story about the Gloucester Charter School that opened and then closed, and now it's open again. 40% of the kids who are going to the Arts Charter School in Gloucester never went to the Gloucester Public Schools. So what happens is the kids left the Gloucester Charter Schools, Some, a few kids left, but not 100 kids, maybe 60, and a lot of money left, enough money to educate the 100, but not as much as, I'm sorry, too much money left. So what I'm trying to say is it's not, it's not a proportional representation. So what happens is Tax dollars are essentially leaving the city school system to subsidize private school tuitions. So when a charter school opens up in a neighborhood that formerly had a parochial school, those kids switch from the parochial school to the charter school and they don't have to pay tuition. But that tuition comes out of the pockets of the Boston Public School, and which means since those kids haven't left the Boston Public Schools, the cost of educating those kids is roughly the same. So what happens is we have to absorb extra costs. So yes, we criticize charter schools, and we have good reason. And if the charter schools offered programs for all students, and if their matriculating population showed the same demographic as our public school system, then we can begin to make a fair comparison between the schools. By the way, uh, public schools don't seek any of the freedoms that charter schools seem to enjoy. And I use the word freedom guardedly. The public schools don't want the freedom to exclude kids. They don't want the freedom to have the right not to educate those kids. I just want to spend a little time going, uh, talking about the negotiations that are ongoing now in the school department, just to give you a flavor of, of what we do. Uh, we just finished a round of negotiations on turnaround schools, which are the underperforming schools. Um, and we spent a lot of time discussing what would make schools better. None of this ever made the newspaper. So in case you read the Globe, you probably didn't know uh, that we've been talking about a variety of things for the underperforming schools, none of which, by the way, feather our own nest. We want to have a reading program. The city has no targeted reading or reading intervention program in any school. Kids don't read. We know they don't read. There's no targeted reading program. There virtually is no physical education or movement in any school. So kids sit. My daughter went to the Irving School, two hours of math, two hours of English a day. That's four out of the six hours are in two classrooms. And then she had two hours of either computers or two hours of gym. That's it. Talk about a varied uh, education. No, there isn't a varied education. Kids tend to sit in the same room all day for two hours in two hour blocks in areas that are tested by the MCAS. So we're trying to change that. So we're trying to negotiate a change in curriculum in our schools. And by the way, this again doesn't, these aren't selfish requests. 
Um, these are not issues that make it easier for teachers. They don't make it harder, they don't make it easier, but they make it uh, better for kids. Now, both sides are also discussing extending the school day, and you may have a question about that later. Although we disagree on the compensation piece, uh, we want to fix the evaluation process, make it less subjective and more helpful to see if we can improve teaching. We've also agreed on a school-based merit, merit pay plan that will be group-based or school-based and not individually based, and I assume we will uh, negotiate that in the master bargain as well. Um, but on all of these issues, whether it's performance evaluation, merit pay, or how to improve teaching, we sometimes disagree with the school department over the best route um, to get to where we want to go. But this doesn't make us obstructionists. The, degree, the disagreement is fine, and I think it's healthy and it's productive. It's what you ought to expect from thinking adults. So when you read that we're disagreeing over the extension of the school day, please keep in mind that there may be two sides to the story. It doesn't mean that the management side is correct and the labor side is obstructionist. It, it could mean very well that both sides have honest disagreements that they're uh, trying to hammer out. One last point uh, is the issue of individual merit pay. Up until yesterday, merit pay was seen as the answer around the country. It was beautiful. President Obama likes it, the governor likes it, the so-called school reformers from the Boston Foundation like it. <laughs> you can't get race to the top funds unless you embrace merit pay. 11 out of 12 states have embraced merit pay. They love it. It's wonderful, but does it work? Well, it did work until yesterday. And then, of course, if you read the Globe or watched the Lehrer Report last night, Vanderbilt, which I guess is an obstructionist university, uh, did a survey. They gave people $15,000 to increase scores, and scores didn't go up. Now, that's a lot of money. Do you know what the merit pay plan in Boston is? $225. $15,000 does not work. $225, I can assure you. We have a term for it. We call it bupkis. It's nothing. The $225 is not going to work. The $15,000 did not work. Maybe because it doesn't work. Now, you can't pick up the Globe or the New York Times without reading about the benefits of merit pay. As I said, it worked until yesterday. Um, and by the way, go into any school in the city, go to Brookline, go to Newton, and ask anyone if merit pay works. 90% of the people, forget the unions, the unions you know don't like it, and they're obstructionists. Ask anyone you want, if you have friends who are teachers, does individual merit pay work? They'll say, you're wasting your money. We do the best job we can, just like the plumber goes in and does the best job he can, just like the lawyer goes in and does the best job he can. We don't need to give us a bonus, because that assumes we're not trying that hard. And that's an insult to people. Ask anyone you want about merit pay, they'll tell you the same thing. So maybe the teachers in the unions have been right about merit pay, and maybe the criticism of merit pay is not obstructionist at all. Maybe actually it makes sense. And maybe it has made sense. And even though we have been labeled as obstructionists for opposing charter schools, opposing individual merit pay, maybe we have shown some common sense. Maybe we haven't been wrong. And by the way, maybe we have been wrong. But let's assume for the sake of argument that we're reasonable adults, we're thinking adults, and, and we figured out that maybe it isn't a good idea, so now Vanderbilt has come forward, but if you, uh, I will tell you that tomorrow some other institute might come forward the other, on the other side, it's like China schools. It goes back and forth like caffeine. Is it good for you or not good for you? Uh -huh. We'll find out over the next few years, but I encourage school districts not to waste a lot of money on merit pay. And please, we don't want the $225 uh, that they're offering us in Boston, because I don't think that will do it. Anyway, I want to leave you with the following. Not all educational reform ideas are good or innovative. Whether the ideas come from President Obama, the Nashville School Board, which is where Vanderbilt did its study, or even the Boston Foundation, doesn't make it a good idea. An opposition to these ideas, or a questioning of these ideas, even from the Boston Teachers Union, is not always obstructionist. Sometimes opposition might be sensible. I want to leave you finally, teacher unions are not the enemy of public education and public 
uh, employee unions are not the enemy of good, effective government. We have a job to do in representing our employees. Uh, we try to do it well because we have a stake in making our schools as good as they can be. Thank you very much.